Hey everyone, this video is an introduction to section 2.11 of market failure, which is a market failure due to firms having market power. <clears throat> In this video, we're going to look at four different types of market, the four market structures, and eventually our analysis of these will have us see how the firms having market power can lead to allocative inefficiency. So our market failure. All right, we will eventually want a concise summary of these market structures. So for your notes, I really suggest you draw up your table as so quite big uh, in your books and it will just, it'll just summarize everything quite neatly. So we'll, you can pause now and do that or, and then we will go on to start talking about perfect competition. So oh yeah, <laughs> before that, um, the blue ones here, the blue areas, these are, these are the characteristics or the assumptions of the models that we would use to define the model. So if you get asked to define perfect competition, you would say it's a market structure that has, you know, this number of firms, this type of good, this sort of entry into the industry. Okay. Now we'll get on to perfect competition. So perfect competition is characterized by having many small firms that sell homogenous goods. Now, homogenous means the goods are identical from one firm to the next. That means consumers would have absolutely no preference as to which firm they buy from. What kind of market has this? Uh, well, an agricultural market uh, would be a good one. So wheat or rice where each firm, they sell the same thing. Uh, also, the share market is an example of it. If I'm buying a share of a company, do I care who I buy it from? No, not really. It's the same share. The, the good is exactly the same, the thing I end up with. Uh, it, what's really important to know here is that this is a theoretical market structure. So none of, none of these markets perfectly meet the assumptions of perfect competition but it helps us to understand the other market structures. So yeah, like I said, it's a theoretical market structure. Okay, um, another aspect of perfect competition is that each firm has no control over price, so no market power. This is due to the goods being homogenous. They're exactly the same. If I don't care which firm I buy from, I, what I'll care about is the price. Right? If, if everyone's selling the same thing, why would I pay any more from one per, from one firm than from another? Um, I'll just go to the lowest price. We say that price takers, um, firms in perfect competition. So the price decided by the market, not the firm. Uh, there are also assumed to be no barriers to entry for firms to enter the industry. That is, there's absolutely nothing stopping new firms entering the market and producing and competing. We'll see a bit later on why this is unrealistic. Okay, uh, that's what we need to know for now about perfect competition. Now, monopoly. Uh, we all have the idea of a monopoly being one firm in an industry. In its purest sense, yes, uh, this would be an organization like SA Water, right? Um, they were the only firm in South Australia that provide water distribution services um, and tap water distribution, essentially. Uh, but one dominant firm in an industry can also be a monopoly. So, for example, in the market for genetically modified corn, um, Monsanto is a company. They control over 80% of the market. So it's still considered a monopoly because they are that dominant. Uh, likewise, De Beers at its peak... Um, they sold more than 80% of the world's diamonds, so they were by far the most, the dominant firm there. Okay, uh, the good of a monopoly also has no close substitute. It is unique. For example, no other precious stone is quite like a diamond. A genetically modified corn is, is not like regular corn. Uh, Okay, it is extremely difficult for a competitor to enter a monopoly market. There are high barriers to entry. 
One reason can be the economies of scale that the monopoly firm has. So think of SA Water um, and the pipes going to every single property in the state. They can do it at a low cost because they do it on such a scale. The only way another firm could compete is if they also produced at such a scale, which is practically impossible. Uh, there can also be... Oh, there we are. Um, there can also be patents, exclusive rights to an invention. An example of where this went famously wrong is uh, Mr. Punchable Face over here. He bought a company with a patent on HIV drugs. And as when he bought the company, he raised the price by 5,000%. Uh, he had a huge barrier to entry. No one could compete because it wasn't legal for anyone else to make that drug. The company held the patent. So that's a legal barrier to entry. Uh, another type is a copyright. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much the same as a patent, I guess. Um, no one apart from Disney is allowed to make a film about Mickey Mouse. So this is clearly a huge barrier to entry as well. And as we saw uh, with the raising of the price, a monopolist has control over price. They have complete control over price. We can consider them price makers as opposed to price takers in perfect competition. Okay, uh, the next, next market structure is monopolistic competition. This is the most common market structure. You see it every day. So I think it will be relatively straightforward. Just uh, not the name, it's a bit tricky. So we'll discuss that later. Uh, the first assumption of the model is that there are many small firms in the market. Okay, um, I think markets like cafes, hairdressers, and clothing stores. They sell differentiated goods. The goods are pretty much the same, but a bit different. So in one sense, coffee is coffee, but coffee at, a, at one cafe is not the same as coffee at another. The beans, the barista, the ambiance, uh, they're all different. Uh, likewise, all hairdressers cut hair, but some do it differently to others. Some have a nicer, nicer place. Uh, some have better chat, for example. Uh, Another assumption about monopolistic competition is that there are low barriers to entry. So say I want to start my own cafe, uh, Bombs Brews. What are my barriers to entry? I have to rent a building, buy a coffee machine, do a barista course. So maybe tens of thousands of dollars. So it's a barrier to me entering. Not everyone's got that sort of cash, but it's a small barrier. For a business to to get over uh, now control over price they have some control over price um, you might be willing to pay an extra one dollar for coffee from your favorite cafe or an extra twenty dollars for the for the right haircut from your favorite but there is a limit to that so at some point if a firm in monopolistic competition raises prices too much consumers will switch to a competitor so they don't have complete control there Okay, and lastly, we're going to look at oligopolies. Yes. Uh, oligopolies are characterized by, characterized by having a few large dominant firms. So think of the supermarket industry in Australia. Coles or worse are the, by far the biggest, and then there's the smaller ones like Audi, but still few large dominant firms. Uh, gaming consoles, um, phones. Uh, domestic airlines, all right, just a small number of very large firms. Okay, for the types of goods in an oligopoly, they can be differentiated, as we can see in these examples. Um, you know, supermarkets aren't exactly the same. Um, flying on one airline in Australia isn't exactly the same as flying on the other. They're differentiated, but they can also be um, undifferentiated or homogenous. So an example of this would be the oil industry. So there's a, there's a few large companies and they all make the same thing. They make crude oil. Uh, it's, it's homogenous. Okay. Uh, barriers to entry. These are high. 
Uh, think of the startup cost to compete with a supermarket, to compete with Coles and Woolworths. Um, there's a huge startup costs. Um, startup costs to compete with an airline, you're spending billions of dollars there, perhaps buying those planes. Uh, another barrier is that because these firms are large, they can take advantage of economies of scale. So uh, the soft drink market is another oligopolistic market. To anyway compete on price with Coke, a new entrant would have to produce on an enormous scale as well, because otherwise they just couldn't compete on that on that price. This makes it very difficult to enter the industry. And with their market power, they have significant control control over price. They are uh, generally only one of a few firms in the market, so they've got something something good going for them. Now. We've taken notes in our table. Here is what it should look like pretty much. Here we are. Um, I'll leave that up for you. Obviously you can pause this um, if you didn't quite get the same things, but this is a very going to be a very useful summary of these market structures. Okay, see you later.